Thank you all very much for coming. Everyone can get, get, find the most comfortable seat. They're all alike, so it doesn't make any difference. Uh, <clears throat> welcome uh, to another of our special programs being held in connection with the 100th anniversary of the White Mountain National Forest of New Hampshire and Maine, uh, right? Uh, our next presentations will take place on Saturday, September 15th, starting at 1 p.m. when Gordon Stewart, who is with us tonight from Westbrook, will speak about <clears throat> multiple use management and the Evans Notch plan of the 1970s, <clears throat> back when Bethel had its own Ranger District office, uh, the Evans Notch office. Um, there was a very uh, lengthy review of the uh, management of the uh, Evans Notch District, which has now been folded in uh, with the Androscoggin District and is under the auspices of the uh, Ranger District in Gorham on Route 16. So that will be at 1 p.m. Later, <clears throat> this is during Harvest Fest, uh, later at 3 p.m. there will be a showing of the one-hour film the People's Forest, the story of the White Mountain National Forest. When President Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office during the Great Depression, one out of four Americans was out of work and financial collapse was common. Roosevelt immediately established a variety of programs, including the CCC, uh, one of the most successful federal government programs in our history, to put people back to work and improve our natural resources, parks, and forests. Tonight, Forrester and environmentalist consultant, environmental consultant, excuse me, David Govatsky of Jefferson, who worked for the U.S. Forest Service for more than 30 years, will explore the legacy of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, and their work in the White Mountain region of New Hampshire and Maine in this illustrated talk. So would you please join me in giving a very warm welcome to David Govatsky. So I was asked to be on this particular uh, Youth Conservation Corps camp. It was a 40-person camp, um, and there were 10 of us. We had them for seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So, you know, it's an interesting experience. I was just out of the Army and um, working with these young people. But one of the people that was there, um, he was an educational advisor, and he was in his, well, late 60s. He had been in the Civilian Conservation Corps and he had worked in that. And this guy had so much knowledge, and he later became what we would call industrial arts teacher and that, but he had all of these techniques and skills, and I learned so much from him. And it was at a civilian conservation old camp that I worked at, and so it was really quite fun to, uh, to be part of that. So uh, since then, I've worked with the Youth Conservation Corps. I worked with them for two weeks this summer. Uh, crew from Vermont. I worked uh, with the uh, Young Adult Conservation Corps, the Job Corps, and many other Conservation Corps crews around the country. And it, it's really great work uh, being able to have that opportunity to do useful conservation work. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see, I think I'll stand in the back um, so I won't be blinding your view here. And uh, if you can't hear me, give me a yell. Sure, on that end, yeah, that you can. Okay, wrong ones. How's that? Okay, all right. We can take it as the unofficial slogan of the um, Civilian Conservation Corps. This particular camp is the Saco Camp on the Saco River, and it's taken from um, one of the ledges above above the camp. And just my opening picture. And there we go. Um, and again, this is part of the uh, White Mountain National Forest Centennial, 100 years of, of service. And just to give you a few of the objectives here, why was there a Civilian Conservation Corps? The purpose of the CCC, and where were the camps? When were the camps in operation? How did they operate? Who were the CCC men? And why did the CCC make such a difference? And before I forget, there were also a few camps that had been set up for women, and they were called she-she-she camps. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> it is true. 
<laughs> well, let's, let's take a look. Uh, we'll set the stage. And um, there were a number of things going on, but I'll start talking first about the, the stock market crash. There had been quite a bit of uh, investment in the stock market. Banks were essentially loaning money out, uh, essentially with 10% down, and people were buying stocks as fast as they could. And there wasn't a lot of backing behind it. And all of a sudden, things collapsed. It was a domino effect. Black Friday, 1929, the banks had loaned all of this money. They failed. They were failing. Thousands of banks were failing on this, and uh, quite a bit of panic. Uh, about 30% unemployment by 1932. And my dad was still working, but his income was at least down by 40%. Uh, he was just fortunate to have a job, uh, but my uncle, my uncle Bruno, uh, was out of work. This was in upstate New York, um, and so he got to work in the Civilian Conservation Corps in, in Colorado. Uh, but a million small farms were lost to foreclosure. Uh, there was severe drought, which led to the Dust Bowl. We'll talk about these things. And there's quite a bit of inaction by the president, President Herbert Hoover, at the time. And this was a very typical scene, these uh, soup kitchens and uh, food. And you see these, many of these men are, you know, well-dressed. They probably had professional jobs. And they were um, out of work, and there was no place to turn to. There was no unemployment checks that were available. Um, uh, the, the banks were failing. Uh, there was no federal deposit insurance corporation where your money was guaranteed in the banks. And so it, things were pretty bleak. And things were, were happening uh, that were not good um, throughout the country. Why can't you give my dad a job, for instance? There are pictures out of uh, a woman sitting on, um, on a porch, and she has a sign, uh, kids for sale. She's selling her kids because she cannot feed them. And that's how, that's how grim it was. Also, has anybody ever heard of the uh, Bonus Army March? Okay, a few of you historians out there uh, are familiar with this. The Bonus Army essentially were primarily World War I veterans that had been promised a bonus for serving uh, in Europe during the war, the, the First World War. Uh, there were other people from the Spanish-American War and the Boxer Rebellion and fighting in the Philippines, and they were uh, promised a bonus. Uh, because so many people were out of work, uh, the Bonus Army decided to go to Washington, D.C. and to march and to ask for their bonus. And the U.S. Capitol building in the background here. Here's a picture of the encampment. They were called Hoovervilles for the, for the president at the time. Uh, again, these were, these were veterans. However, uh, President Hoover was really quite concerned. The FBI director at the time thought that they were communist and that they were going to incite violence. And um, so he ordered his army chief of staff, who happened to be General Douglas MacArthur, uh, to put down the... Uh, uh, this march and to you know, get them out of town. Unfortunately, uh, Douglas MacArthur took it a little bit too literally and he actually uh, attacked the, the marchers with uh, cavalry, it was the last cavalry charge in US Army history. And even worse, they used the, the same veterans that had been gassed, including my grandfather, uh, who had been gassed in, in uh, France uh, in World War I, were again gassed with tear gas uh, during this particular thing. Uh, two men were killed. A number of them were seriously injured. And this just outraged uh, the American public. They just could not believe that um, you know, the American forces were fighting these veterans. Here's a picture here, burned flag. and. You see a couple of people with broken noses and, and that. Um, the other, uh, incidentally, uh, Douglas MacArthur's uh, adjutant, his assistant, was another guy by the name of Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, so there's a little bit of a history connection there. And Eisenhower warned MacArthur, he says, don't, don't attack them. Well, that's not what we're here for. So, so this really outraged the American public. 
Uh, however, there was a second bonus army march, and uh, I'll jump ahead a little bit, in May of 1933, and this is after Franklin Roosevelt had already been elected. And Roosevelt went to his army chief of staff, just happened to be the same guy, MacArthur, and he said, you will feed them, you will house them, you will transport them, and, and uh, there won't be any violence. And of course, they had 868 tents are set up here, and MacArthur did a good job of uh, taking care of them. They still didn't get their bonus, because that was up to Congress, the, and, and the president uh, couldn't do it. So Hoover sent the army and the police to, to this uh, march, uh, to the first march, and um, actually on the second march, uh, Roosevelt sent uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, his wife, and uh, and they actually were transported, and they you know they they made their case at uh, at Congress, and at the same time the Dust Bowl was occurring. These are some pretty epic pictures, and I I've been a real student of the Dust Bowl, and I've spent a fair amount of time in northern Texas, and Colorado, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska, and in particular this one corner of uh, Oklahoma where it started, and. Uh, and in some cases, you know, it's, it has not recovered. And part of it was because they were plowing up the prairie. And the prairie had, you know, very good lush plant growth on it. And the roots were really well established. But underneath it, there was a fair amount of sand. And once they opened it up, and they didn't have crop rotation or other conservation practices that they used, conservation really wasn't thought of. Uh, and things just started... Uh, going crazy as far as uh, being able to uh, uh, prevent the erosion that was going on. Oop. Go back here. So here's a, another picture here. Farmer Two Sons uh, run for shelter in Cimarron County, Oklahoma. This was the heart of the Dust Bowl, but we actually had brown snow here as far away as uh, in Maine and, and New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Um, much of the topsoil was going into the Atlantic Ocean from uh, these areas out west. So it was, it was pretty serious. And here's a picture of um, uh, Florence Owens Thompson, a destitute mother of, of seven. She had moved from Oklahoma, age of 32. She has seven children already. And she's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's truly a look of despair on, on her face. So things were tough. At the same time, during the Great Depression, it was not just in the United States. It was occurring in Canada, and it was occurring in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, due to the Treaty of Versailles ending World War I, Germany had a lot of debt to pay, um, a lot of things that were going on over there, and, and, and things were pretty bad. However, with the rise of this despot, Adolf Hitler, who came in, uh, promising jobs and, and other things. Um, for instance, he started this Reich Labor Service in, uh, as early as 1933, putting young men to work building roads. Uh, here's, here's their flag. Excuse me, here my little clicker is going a little crazy. There we go. There's their flag. Um, and the same thing was going on in Italy with uh, Benito Mussolini and in the Soviet Union at the time with Stalin. Um, they weren't having the same problems. And so Americans were looking at uh, communism. They were looking at uh, the, the Nazi uh, system and at fascism saying, well, at least they have jobs. And so there was growing in interest in you know, this Bolshevik uh, type revolution coming here to the United States. And so it was a big concern for the political leaders and, you know, for Americans in general. And here's one of the roads that was built by the German Labor Service. So when Roosevelt was elected, he was elected in November of 1932. Just take a, take a look here. Uh, it's interesting. Um, he won most, Roosevelt was in the blue, of course, and Hoover, <laughs> I don't know, you guys over here in Maine, you, you voted for Mr. Hoover, of course, Vermont and New Hampshire did, and Connecticut and Pennsylvania, I think, uh, and Delaware, so. But uh, Franklin Roosevelt and John Garner, they won with 472 electoral votes, which was, you know, pretty, pretty big, uh, 
win right there, 22 million votes. Herbert Hoover, uh, yeah, did not even win his uh, state of uh, Iowa. So uh, that was the story right there. Hoover, um, Hoover essentially lost. He just mishandled what was going on. And people wanted a change, and they wanted a new deal, which is what Franklin Delano Roosevelt promised. And he was inaugurated on the 4th of March. And in just a few days, on the 9th of March, he got together with the Secretaries of Labor, War, Agriculture, and Interior. And he turned to, to the War Department and said, can you provide housing for 250,000 men? And he went to uh, agriculture and he said, can the Soil Conservation Service and the Forest Service provide technical leaders to have work for this? And of course, they said yes. Interior for the National Park Service and, and other agencies in there. And they all agreed that they would do it. They would have 250,000 um, men that were employed by the 1st of July. So FDR sends his proposal to Congress on the 21st of March. Things moved pretty quick. Uh, Senate Bill 598 on the 31st of March was approved. And this guy, Robert Fechner, was hired and funds were approved on the 5th of April. First camp was established on the 17th of April. And instead of 250,000 men, they had 300,000 enrollees because Roosevelt said, I'm going to take this bonus army and provide them with opportunities to work. And 25,000 bonus army soldiers signed up. Some were in their 50s, and uh, I think 60 was the oldest. And th those were the, the essentially the veterans camps. And then there were junior camps for those that were 18 to 25. <clears throat> he also hired uh, 10,000 Native Americans, uh, Indians, and all of the territories. So the 48 states and the t uh, territories of Alaska, Hawaii, and uh, uh, Puerto Rico, and, and those other uh, territories had camps. The one difference, though, on the Native American camps on the reservations, the army was not invited to go there for <laughs> obvious reasons. Yes, yes. So 300,000, and that would be the equivalent of 1.2 million young men put to work in the United States today. Can you imagine having that done in a matter of about 90 days? So uh, here's Camp Roosevelt on the, uh, the Roose um, it, it's on the George Washington National Forest in Virginia, and 37 days afterwards, and so uh, you can see some of the some of the young men there. FDR and this guy Robert Fechner right over there in the CCC service. One of the biggest problems was the men were underweight; they were undernourished. And it took them, uh, a number of them failed a number of times to get into the CCC program because they were not 98 pounds. That was the minimum weight. And uh, uh, FDR was uh, joking with the server, servers actually from Minnesota uh, saying that uh, you guys have gained 12 pounds. I need to lose 12 pounds. And, uh, and so that's interesting. But let me tell you about this guy, Robert Fechner. One of the big points of opposition to the CCC program was the unions. The union said, you're going to be paying these people a dollar a day, and you know that's going to take all of our union jobs. And so uh, Roosevelt was, uh, was pretty shrewd. He decided that he would find a union person to run the entire program. And he hired uh, a person from Boston who was the president of a, uh, one, of the, one of the unions in Boston, put him to work, and this guy was incredible. And he basically negated any of the opposition from, from the unions. So, so that was a good way, to, good way to handle that. So FDR had a lot of um, other agencies. I call them the alphabet agencies, the Work Progress Administration, the National Recovery Act, the Tennessee Valley Authority, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and and there were a lot of really great programs, but of all of those, the Civilian Conservation Corps was probably the most successful for a number of reasons that we'll be talking about. Here's a decal here, three and a half cents. I don't know how they figured that out, but uh, retail five cents. This is the, the logo that they have uh, for the CCC. Things happened pretty, pretty quick. And um, here are some of the patches that you see here. The V. That indicates that is a veterans camp. So those would be, you know, 
let's say, at the age in, in 1933, these guys were probably born, uh, if they're serving in World War I, born in 1900, uh, World War I, they'd serve in 1918, and it's already 1933, 34, 35. So they're, they're in their mid-30s and going into these camps. And here are some of the other you know, patches, but almost all of them, and I think all of them actually, have a tree because they were also called Roosevelt's Tree Army because they planted millions and probably billions of trees uh, throughout the country. Uh, they actually had one project that was designed to fight the Dust Bowl, and that was in the Great Plains. And they were going to be building a shelter belt from Texas all the way on up into Alberta, onto the border in, in Canada. And, uh, and so they, they did a lot. They put a lot of shelter belts in, and they did a lot of really good work. So th these patches that you see here, I've got several here. Uh, just give you a quick quiz. What, this is a corporal. And so they took a lot of military designs, but what is the trade? It's a baker. It's a baker. Yeah. The cook has a skull and crossbones. No, no, no. <laughs> no, this is, this is a cook here. And so, you know, they just, and there's another cook here. This would go on the collar. How about this guy? A truck driver. That was one of the plush jobs. This was the most hated person in camp. This is the bugle boy for Reveille at 0600 in the morning and then taps at uh, 10 o'clock at night. This was a quartermaster right here. So that person was essentially a supply person where you would go for tools and other supplies. And anytime you see a diamond, that indicates it's a leader of some kind. So uh, what happens is if the cream of the crop rises and some people are you know, leaders and they become leaders. And so this one here is a sergeant and becomes a, becomes a leader after a time. Uh, but these chevrons, um, you see different colors. Um, this is a messenger, motor messenger, the mechanic, again, another leader. And this guy over here, anybody know what that position is? Teacher. Teacher. Yes, that's the f a fountain of knowledge. So that's an educator. Uh, it was determined that these camps, you know, it, it took a while to work the the things out to see what worked and what didn't work. They found out that uh, roughly 8% of the enrollees could not read or write. They were illiterate. And, uh, and a number of them had never used a toothbrush in their life. And so they were issued all of these things. And so they decided that they needed to have educational advisors. Here's just some military pins that they had. We're in the First Army Corps. The way the camps were set up, uh, Roosevelt really had to use the military. And that's why there was some opposition, because they thought it was just going to be another army after the World War I experience. But the army was really involved because they're the only ones who could organize this mass mobilization that had never occurred that big in the United States and has never occurred to this point. Even during World War II, the mobilization that was here was, was greater in the amount of time that it was done. SFS is State Forest Service, SCS is Soil Conservation Service, and, and so forth. So that, that's what the brass uh, would, be, uh, would be wearing. So there's a number of camps that are out there, and I just happen to have a 1937 National Geographic map, which is a perfect one. If you've ever seen it of the White Mountains, it, it covers a pretty good part of um, the main part of the White Mountain National Forest, too. Here's the Livermore Camp, and this is uh, near Bartlett, so it's a Route 302 if you ever get that way. So you see a camp there, you see the Saco River Camp, you see the Swift River Camp, and the Passaconaway Camp. That's, uh, it says the Albany Intervale Road. That's actually the Kankamaugus Highway. So that's a, that's a pretty cool uh, map there. It's got the Wild River Camp on it. Um, I don't have it in this particular picture, but Cold River and the Chatham Camps, which uh, essentially either close to Maine or in Maine. But this is a very typical camp. And the camps could be transported in, in roughly a half a dozen rail cars. They were prefab. Everything was designed for 200 men. And the barracks would hold 40 men uh, per barracks. And so they could set up a camp essentially in five days, depending if they were going to be pouring concrete or putting them on, uh, on piers. And this is what it looked like on the inside. 
Swift River. Bunk room here, you can see it's a head to toe. If you've ever been in the military in the barracks like that, you'll recognize that. It's essentially to stop the spread of colds and, and things like that. But they were not plush, but they did have um, a fireplace that was either wood. In some cases, they, they also had coal. Uh, so there, there was a, a fire guard who had to be on duty all night to keep in the wintertime to keep the fire going. And some of these guys really, you know, they were kind of like night owls. They'd just as soon stay up all night. And so the other crew members would pay to keep this guy on, on fire guard duty the whole time. So because he didn't want to work in the daytime or, or something. But here's the mess hall, very typical mess hall. And uh, you can see the, the folks in the back here. And through the generosity of Kellogg's of Battle Creek, Michigan, they provided these recipe books. And again, for 200 person camps, so there's a specific amounts that you would need, you know, number of pounds of flour per day and, and that. And uh, so they, there's one for summer, spring, winter, fall. And, uh, and so whatever was locally available, they could, they could use this. And so here's a sample menu. This is uh, week three during the summer. And you can see here, it's, uh, I don't know why they put cornflakes down. Okay, that's, <laughs> so, I, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, berries, cornflakes, bacon, cinnamon buns, and beverage. And look what they, well, dinner is what we often call lunch now. Uh, they had, and this is in the field. They don't come back to camp. The cooks actually bring the supplies out to the work site. Roast lamb, mashed potatoes, broccoli. I'm not sure, I've never had a pineapple cheese salad. Sounds pretty good. Bread, apple dumplings, and beverage. And then for supper, or yeah, supper is um, uh, stuffed eggplant, fried, uh, French fried potatoes, celery, cabbage salad, bread, chocolate pudding, and beverage. And you can, you can see these different things, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, so they, they ate pretty well. And in fact, for many of these men, that were here, they had never had three hot meals in a day. Three hots in a cot, that's a, you know, one of the slogans. Another day, another dollar. A lot of these slogans came out of the Civilian Conservation Corps, so I don't know about those grilled sardines on toast, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a little fishy to me, yeah. Uh, uh, young men have, uh, you know, testosterone overdoses in some cases, uh, so, you know, they, they have to work out their uh, their differences. Boxing was very popular in the 1920s and 1930s, and so each camp was authorized a certain amount of athletic equipment. It was $768 a year, and that's that was a lot because you pretty much would multiply that by about 15 times for today's money. So they would have a you know boxing ring, and and there were some pretty good fighters that came out of that. But this particular one is at Swift River, and, and today there's a campground there called Blackberry Crossing Campground on the Kankamogas Highway, and you can still see where the the men would sit and watch these boxing matches. Some of them were grudge matches, but some of them you know were actual sporting <laughs> events. Here's the library. Libraries were really important because you had to keep the publishing industry in business too because they were going out of business left and right. And so by putting together 300,000 men, they needed a lot of books to read, a lot of magazines, and they needed a lot of shovels and a lot of uh, hats and uniforms and other tools and trucks and that. And so again, it boosted the economy. Uh, there was a a standard list of books that were provided, and then they had a rotating list that uh, would these books would move from camp to camp, and it was pretty well done. The Black Mountain Camp was over in uh, western New Hampshire uh, near Mount Musilaki. Pretty good library. You see a globe here. Don't see too many of those anymore, but the libraries were really popular. And here's a book. It's called The Camp Life Reader and Workbook. Um, these are for those that were essentially illiterate, and they're learning how to read and write. And so after work, they would go, there were classes five nights a week, and where they would essentially get the equivalent of a GED 
education by being in this camp. However, there were other courses. You could take courses on uh, radios, on being a mechanic, on forestry, and, and all of these other classes that were available. And so the leaders were essentially putting these classes on. Occasionally, they would contract with the local schools and bring in the teachers there. There was a newspaper at the national level called happy days and uh, essentially it, it was mainly to talk about the CCC and I've got several issues of this particular newspaper and uh, it's a it's a fun one they'll have it from every region of the country and they talk about uh, you know what's what's going on uh, each camp typically had their own newspaper some of them were more in the booklet form this was uh, the Kilkenny camp near Berlin New Hampshire and compliments of the Brown Company and a lot of men learned journalism uh, during this experience and being in the CCC. And, and so I've got a, you know, about three dozen issues of various camp newsletters. And it's really quite interesting. I was reading one the other day from the Wildwood Camp, which is uh, down near um, uh, Easton, Eaton, Easton, New Hampshire. And it's 1936. And they're talking about should the camps be militarized? And there's a you know editorial in there, and they say experts are saying within three years we're, there's going to be a big war in Europe, and it probably will be another world war. And so they spend um, he spends a you know a couple of sentences there talking about it. And it was very prophetic because of course we did uh, go to war actually starting in 1939. Here it is. That's the the Pioneer Company, the 101 Company of uh, Wildwood, New Hampshire and pioneered with hats and everything. It was the first camp in New England on the National Forest. Here's the Tamworth camp. Um, Tamworth is uh, on the southern part of the White Mountains. Uh, and you can see what the menu is here. Coffee. Coffee was pretty tough to get. And Yeah, cigars. Yeah, yeah. They don't <laughs> cigars, cigarettes, and things like that. And the other thing that's interesting is for Thanksgiving and for Christmas, and New Year's, the men were authorized two days off. Many of them would not go home because <clears throat> that would be another mouth to have to feed for their families. Their families were so destitute that the men would just stay and they would have you know, a pretty good, pretty good meal, a turkey, turkey dinner and all that. So uh, yeah, things were very, very tough. They were provided uh, postcards and, and Christmas cards to send home. Uh, here's a sample one with the, with the patch. Uh, and uh, we, we saw there's a copy of that book here uh, tonight. This is the first CCC district of the First Corps. And they're really interesting because this is, a, this is a state park number one. This is Moose Brook over in Gorham, New Hampshire. And uh, the state of New Hampshire actually went and bought uh, an old farm that had gone under and essentially turned it into a state park. And it was a veterans company that was uh, put to work here. Uh, and so they developed a nice state park. Over 800 state parks around the United States were set up by the CCC. There was not a lot of state parks in the United States uh, before the CCC came. And they were the big boost for the state park system. Because you had to put, you had to put these men to work. And there's a, you know, a good history of you know, everything that they did for that particular year. I think it was 1937. Um, interesting, you see the uniforms here. After work, uh, they typically would get back to the camp at about 4.30. They would shower and clean up. They had to be in their uniform for dinner. That was a requirement. Here's a picture of the Wild River camp from the Roost, 1933. There's Wild River over there. Right on the border uh, of Maine, you can see the, the camps that are, that are there. And this was their first day at camp and uh, setting up the camp. And uh, you know, it was a new experience for them. Uh, most of these were, uh, were Maine residents. Look at that truck in the background. That's an old Army World War I truck. And the officers and the technical staff, they got wall tents with flies. So that was pretty nice. And so these were all set up. Um, they would typically have a, a commander who would be a captain and then probably two lieutenants that would be assistants. 
and they would have a surgeon, essentially a doctor, that would be assigned. If they didn't have enough in the military, they would contract out. Oh, on uh, weekends, they would um, bring, they, they couldn't pay them, but they would bring in essentially a, uh, a minister or a priest uh, from the local area to provide religious services. So citizenship was an was a important part of the program. Here are the sleeping tents. These are uh, called uh, uh, GP small, general purpose small tents. They hold 10 men. They're rolled up in the sides. They've got cots here. And this is before permanent barracks would be built. These are temporary. And they'd be pretty hot like yesterday. They'd be pretty hot, 90 degree weather, and that sun beating down on it. Cool off a little bit at night. And this is their first day. They're waiting for chow. They're pretty hungry here. And here it is, chow on the first day. And they were issued a mess kit, which essentially had a uh, knife, fork, and spoon, and a, uh, a, a plate and a, and a fry pan and a, and a canteen. That's what they were issued. And so they, they would clean them in these uh, immersion cans. And after work, uh, this was a few days later, they were playing baseball already. You know, it, it's. You bring 200 young men together, even though they've been in a conditioning camp in Portland, Maine for two weeks, uh, you know, it takes time to develop friendships, but sports is very, very helpful to, uh, you know, get, get the men together. And they also put a phone line in to connect with uh, Gilead. That was one of their first tasks. In the wintertime, this is 1934, they already had the barracks built. You see some smoke coming out. That's the motor pool uh, or motor stables where they would keep the vehicles in the wintertime. Quite a bit of snow there. Oh, sorry. My clicker went crazy. Usually doesn't do that. All right. Here's a, another one. This is Black Mountain over in Haverhill, uh, New Hampshire. They've actually painted the barracks and they've got stone line paths and they've got the flagpole and uh, so things are you know better every day S slow steady improvement and it's good for morale uh, the motor pool of course important we see uh, the that's the educational advisor right over there and you see a couple of uh, uh, medical vehicles you know it was Dangerous work working for the CCC, and I was reading in a two-month period, three men died. One was, um, uh, they were blasting some ledge, and he was about 300 feet away, or actually 294 feet, exactly, according to the accident report. A rock came, got him in the jugular vein, and, and killed him instantly. And another time on the Warren camp, which is way over in western New Hampshire, uh, what happened was, um, three or four of the young men, without permission, decided to climb Mount Musilaki on New Year's. And it was terrible weather. And two of them turned back, and the other two kept going. And they ended up getting in serious trouble. One died, and one was able to you know, sleep in the snow until they were rescued. And then on Christmas Eve, the educational director had just left camp, hit a patch of ice, and went into the uh, wild Amanusik River and was killed. So that was, that was that. Oh, one other one down in Florida. You may never have heard about this. A veterans, three veterans camps were down there building the, this Florida uh, uh, highway out there. They did not know that a hurricane was coming. They didn't have the information in those days. Over 500 were killed. And you don't read about that in the history books, but it's, it's all there. These are all veterans that uh, had served their country, and they in many cases, there were no trees that were even left. Everything was one of the biggest hurricanes we ever had. Here's the Black Mountain Ambulance and the doctor. Lucky driver over there. Nice white wall tires. And Thornton's Infirmary just uh, isn't the fanciest one. It's got tar paper up, but uh, it's an old postcard. And baseball. They would go and compete against other teams. The Gale River Camp, which is in Bethlehem, would compete against the Wildwood Camp. And uh, uh, this is on Trudeau Road and Route 302. And so this is a very popular thing. The other thing that was really popular was getting a ride into, in this case, Littleton, New Hampshire, where there was a movie theater, and then meeting the girls and uh, having some money for, uh, for beers and then having the truck taken back at 10 o'clock at night. So. A uh, number of marriages developed as a result of uh, this, as you can imagine. 
This is a, a, a closer camp, Camp Peabody in uh, Gorham, New Hampshire, presidential range in the background here, and um, uh, the barracks here. And this was a spike camp. This was actually a crew from the Wild River Camp, 156th Company. Um, the CCC camps not only had a name such as Wild River Camp, uh, they had a military number, which was 156. The number one means First Army Corps. And eventually they would run out of, you know, the 100 numbers in that 100 series. So they would have a, a fourth number. So it would be, say, 1560 or something like that. And then Second Army, which is over in New York, that would start with a two and so forth. And then uh, they would have um, the, in this case, this was National Forest 11. Uh, so there's three different numbering systems. So it's a little bit confusing, but uh, interesting. So this camp, uh, Wild River Camp, was set up in, in, um, in late May. I actually might as well call it June 1st. And by July, they already had a spike camp over here. That's Tuckerman Ravine in the background. And I don't know how well you can see this, but uh, typically spike camps are for 25 to 30 men. There'd be a lieutenant and... Uh, and then one Forest Service person. And uh, the guys really liked this because they were away from the main camp. They didn't have a lot of the other chores. And generally, the food was pretty good. So they were doing a lot of work on ski trails uh, and, and building other recreation facilities, including the Glen Ellis Trail that goes down the Glen Ellis Waterfalls. Very iconic picture here. No shirts, but they do have a dust respirator using jackhammers. And building this trail, this was um, a Guy Shorey postcard showing right after it had been completed by the CCC. And it's still a wonderful walk down to the waterfalls. They built a number of high country cabins because skiing was extremely popular in the 1930s. And this is the Wildcat uh, high country cabin. There was a room for essentially six people. Uh, beautiful craftsmanship on this. And they built a... Uh, oh, eight others. Uh, most of them were quite a bit larger, such as this one, the Black Mountain High Country Cabin uh, over in Jackson. And they also had another one nearby called Doublehead, also in Jackson. So these cabins would, this, these would hold about 12 uh, adults. In fact, you can still rent this. It's $40 a night uh, from the Forest Service. So you can get an authentic experience of sleeping in a CCC cabin, including the sounds of the mice chewing at night. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've done it a couple of times. It's interesting. So the, um, the, camps, uh, the camps at Wild River and Cold River down in, in Chatham uh, were working towards each other, and they were building the road through Evans Notch. This is a road that would save a lot of miles, and this was a, this was a major, major effort. The Cold River camp, by the way, used more dynamite than any other uh, CCC company in the eastern United States. They had a lot of blasting to do. And because it was so important, Robert Fechner, the director, came. The chief of the Forest Service came. The, the director of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, all of these other high-ranking government officials and generals showed up because this was a big deal in 1936. This, again, was another success. Now, things were getting better. Uh, the economy was slowly improving. And uh, here they are. There's two CCC men, and they're about to unveil a plaque that's here. And that plaque is still out there and, uh, in Hastings. So uh, speaking to the assembled multitude here and then taking the, uh, the convoy on through, which they often do on these uh, show-me trips that they have. And other things that were going on, building the Zeeland Road, many of the camps were involved in, in road construction. They were using heavy equipment, compressors, jackhammers, lots of explosives uh, on, on this. And this would come in later, you know, really quite handy, these skills that they learned. And, uh, you yeah, know, this is winter operation here. You see these guys, they don't even have earmuffs on. Of course, the, uh, the supervisor is lighting up a cigarette. I don't see his coffee cup here, but uh, uh, they were actually adding fill to the Zealand Road in the middle of winter. And <clears throat> this was uh, 1936 and in 1903, you can still see the evidence of this 1903 forest fire that had burned through this, this area here. So let me tell you a few facts. To be in the CCC, you had to be unemployed 
you had to be unmarried unless you're a veteran. Uh, you could not, they didn't want to take you out of school. You had to be between the ages of 18 and 25. There were many, many CCC men that left after uh, a year in the CCC and they were still 16 years old because they lied about their age to get in. They used their brother's birth certificate to get in and they did whatever they could to do it, uh, to get in because they were, they were desperate. Uh, $30 a month of which, another day, another dollar, uh, of which $25 was sent home to families to help the national economy. So they really spread the wealth. Five dollars, you know, just multiply that times, you know, 15. That's how much they would have. Uh, so it was, it was a fair amount of money that they had for spending money, but it really helped the families back home. Plus, it was, they didn't have another mouth to feed at the table, and that was important too. Uh, the leaders, uh, those that would move up, uh, would earn 36 to 45 dollars, and always the big concern in towns, it, you know, whether it's uh, it's Gilead, Maine, or um, you know Wildwood, New Hampshire, you got 200 young men coming into your town, and you, you know you got some young ladies too, so they're you know they're wondering about that, but. More importantly, you got a bunch of, you know, probably some carpenters, a mason, a plumber, and that they're saying, they're going to take all my jobs away. So what the CCC did, and, you know, the Forest Service didn't have the capability to, you know, have a bunch of carpenters and that. They hired LEM, local experienced men, and they were, um, they were authorized, 16 of them per camp, and they were paid $140 a month. So this, again, took care of all of the local, well, most of the local opposition to, um, to having a camp coming into town. Uh, so, so that was kind of a good thing. And a camp foreman, let's see, it was Bob Monahan, who later worked at the observatory on Mount Washington and fairly famous. He was the foreman at Wild River. Military ran the camps essentially from 4.30 in the afternoon until 8 o'clock in the morning. And then the sponsoring agency had a superintendent. Forest Service, in most cases around here, or could be state park uh, superintendent. Educational advisors, typically contract doctors. And you could sign up for a six-month tour. If you were accepted, you could go for up to four of these six-month tours. And uh, my uncle stayed on for, um, for, for two years in the CCC before he, he left. But the objective for the superintendent of these camps was to find jobs. And so if, say, a construction company was saying, you know, we need an experienced person in that, they would typically find a really good worker and send them off. And, and that was uh, part of the performance, is to get these guys out of here, get them good jobs, and, and to do that. And they learned how to fight forest fires. Here's the Gale River Camp. They were not allowed to have dogs, so I'm not sure what that four-legged creature is over there, but most camps had at least a dog. The wild, the wild wood, not the wild river, the wild wood camp had a porcupine as a pet. <laughs> <laughs> it was a prickly situation, but uh, here's a, a rain gauge, this uh, enrollee, very typical sh green shirt and uh, denim pants. He's uh, taking weather readings. Here are the books that they, they had. We can take it, again, that unofficial motto by Ray Hoyt. Wonderful book. And it tells you what it is going to be like to work in the CCC. And it was a very popular type of a book. Each enrollee would get an enrollee handbook, and, uh, and they, would, they would take care of that. There were lots of other publications that were out. The, here's the National Park Service came out with this book on rope knots and climbing. And then woodsmanship. And you say, well, these kids don't need to know how to use an axe. Well, frankly, many of these kids actually came from the city. New York City, Boston, Hartford, you know, these are the, still the population centers. So they, they had this 12-page uh, booklet on what not to, um, what's poison ivy, for instance, and how to use an axe, how to sharpen tools, and how to do these things. But they would learn pretty quick, but still, woodsmanship was, uh, was very important. Use of explosives. And uh, which was always a fun thing. And then these vocational education publications. I have, these are all copies that I have. I have a pretty big library now of CCC pubs. This is photography. It was very popular. You learn about this in the evening. And so they actually had a book with all of your lesson plans that would show you how to do it. 
Uh, radios was another one. And mechanics, of course, everyone wanted to, to be a mechanic. Here's a crew building the Bartlett Supply Depot in Bartlett, New Hampshire. It's the Saco Camp in 1935. Um, this is the Warren to Woodstock Road, January. That's a pretty nice looking bridge, uh, concrete bridge. So they're learning some really good skills. Learning how to use a rock crusher from the West Campton Camp, which is uh, off of the Interstate 93. Here they're learning how to make uh, terrain relief models in camp, and there's their little pin. So this particular company was 1101, uh, I think it is, and and so they're they're making these raised relief models. There was only two camps that did that: the one in Campton and the one in Bartlett, and that was nationwide. And here's this is actually West Virginia that they're actually making a relief model for West Virginia, learning that skill. That's so important. And here you see learning masonry at the Tuckerman Ravine Shelter. And this was a crew from Massachusetts. Initially, the Civilian Conservation Corps was uh, integrated uh, so that blacks and whites would work together. Um, but in the South, there was a lot of opposition to integration. And so after about nine months, they segregated all of the camps. Uh, of course, in the northern tier of states, you know, whether it's Minnesota or Wisconsin and Michigan and, and uh, coming into uh, New Hampshire and, and Maine, they just pretty much ignored it. And so I've been looking at the records and you'd, you'd have what, eight Negroes would be in this particular camp or something. And I did not, I did not read of any problems. There were concerns that, you know, they wouldn't work as hard, but in general, the reports that I've read is that they worked harder than many of the others because they didn't have that many other opportunities in the civilian world and, uh, and they got along pretty well. So uh, that was interesting. Uh, blacks were not allowed in leadership positions initially for first uh, roughly three years, but finally uh, there were some uh, black supervisors and then black officers and then of all things, I mean, it almost caused the revolution in, in Gettysburg National Battlefield. They actually had a um, all black camp, 200 black men, all black supervisors from the National Park Service and all of the army officers were black. So uh, that was an experiment. It worked well, but uh, there were a lot of problems in New York State with these integrated camps. And uh, uh, but that was what was happening then. Um, in 1938, of course, in September of 38, we had that big um, hurricane that came through. And so they had to reopen a number of the camps that had been shut down. Many of the camps, you know, would be in operation only for two years, get all the work done, and then they tear the camp down, move it to the next location. So here at Wildwood, they had a lot of work to do, so local carpenters were, were coming in. So three million men participated in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Most went on to serve in World War II. My uncle Bruno served at, uh, 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 in the Pacific. He was wounded at Guadalcanal. And, uh, and you know when I talked to him, he was one of my favorite uncles. He would never talk about the war. He would only talk about his experience in Colorado and on a national forest over there. And so I think I, I learned a lot from him too. So here's an honorable discharge uh, of an individual that had been in the CCC. Um, and I think that if we did not have these three million men that knew how to work with each other, that knew how to operate heavy equipment, use explosives, and had discipline, and were strong, and were not underweight, undernourished, or you know, ascribing to uh, uh, Bolshevism or fascism or communism, uh, you know, they went on. They went on to serve in World War II, and so we would have been in serious trouble had we not had that. And during World War II, some of the camps were reopened. Uh, CPS stands for Civilian Public Service. Um, that was Camp 53 in Gorham, the same Camp Peabody that was used um, by the young men um, prior to that. It was run by the American Friends Service Committee, which is the Quakers, and the Forest Service from 1942 to 43. These were men who did not want to go fight in a war, but they wanted to serve their country. And... Um, and they did different things. I mean, these are, they're testing 
various diets and you know uh, going through lots of exercise. But they did things like you know trail work and fighting <laughs> fires and and so forth. And so I give them credit. I you know I had 24 years in the military. I give these guys credit. Great book if you ever want to read it. CPS story. Uh, wonderful story about these men during World War II. Who didn't want to do it. Obviously, there's you know people that are not going to be happy, particularly if you're a family you've lost someone in the war. So you conscientious objectors keep to hell out of this shop. So yeah, that's you know the way it is. And then of course in uh, World War II we had guest workers from Germany and Austria um, that. Uh, well, I guess not guest workers, but uh, it was a POW camp that uh, at Camp Stark in Percy. Uh, and so, again, Civilian Conservation Corps camp, you know, the barracks were already set up. Um, and so they put some barbed wire and they put uh, guard towers around it. And, uh, and these uh, soldiers from uh, Africa Corps and various uh, other units of the German uh, and Austrian forces um, were put here to cut firewood or a cut pulpwood for the for the brown company they were going to berlin but it was a different uh, berlin not the one in germany so today you can go by uh, route 302 you can you can see this chimney each camp had two fireplaces one of course for the officers uh, quarters and one for the recreation hall this is the recreation hall for the livermore camp on route 302 and you can see the flashing on the side and they did a nice job in these fireplaces if you go to the Blueberry, Blackberry Crossing on um, Kankamaugus Highway uh, near Conway, they actually have a Forest Service interpretive trail with all of the panels that you have here. And you can see some of the chimneys. Unfortunately, the Forest Service had to put a grate over here because people kept wanting to build a fire and roast mm -hmm. hot dogs in there. So it was a bit of a problem. Uh, but it's a neat trail. It's a, a quarter mile, and it's, it's paved, and it's a, a good way to learn about the CCC. And uh, there's a, a, a CCC scout camp in Tamworth. This is Hemingway State Forest. Uh, you can go in, and so that's a, that's, there's a camp there now. Uh, and Triple I had a camp uh, near Waterville Valley. You still see the slabs and the foundation of these particular camps. Working on roads and trails, that was their primary job. And anybody know what this feature is? I can tell you that's concrete. And you saw a picture earlier of a guy. Um, this is a flagpole. There's, there's two posts that go in the ground. In the center would be the pole. And in case the pulley ever got stuck on the flag, they had a, the ability to lower that, that pole. And so that's, that was in the ground. So that's kind of a neat thing to see at the Warren camp. And I've been to all 21 camps that were in the White Mountains, including those here in Maine. Um, there were over 3,000 camps around the country. I haven't quite gotten there, but I've probably been up to 50 camps. They pretty much, the layout is very, very similar. Here, I, I didn't think I'd ever find the Warren camp. I didn't have much of a map, but on my Nuvi, my little navigator in my car, it told me CCC road coming up. So that's pretty good. So, But the telephone line is still there, so that was pretty cool. And here's the remains of an old vehicle at the, at the Warren camp. And here's the actual water supply. My, my friend Mike Dickerman uh, from uh, Boncliffe Books, we're working on a book on the CCC. I don't know when we'll ever get it done, but we're checking out the water supply here, and, uh, and that's where it would go to the camp. This is the worst job, having to clean the grease trap. Anybody ever have to clean a gr grease trap? Not a good job. In the military, if you really screw up, you have to clean it with your toothbrush. And uh, it's a little pipe coming out of there, but that's where the grease is, is trapped. And this is the water supply. It's a water intake. It's a clay pipe that went into the Saco River and uh, pulled it out. And there's the pump house, which basically pumped the water. You can see it does have high water experiences. And in fact, two of the camps were flooded out because they're too close to the river. The Saco camp, they barely made it out. And they had to move to a new camp, which became Livermore Camp. And then the uh, Pass Conaway camp got flooded out, too. Um, Here's a camp in, in Maine. Uh, there's a Chatham, Chatham camp. And uh, that was doing mostly forestry type work. And here, this is a rock pillar. They typically would have that on the entrance to the camps. It's just over the border in New Hampshire from Maine. And you can see that. And you can, you can still find these uh, 
concrete slabs uh, where they would uh, have either the kitchen or, or the uh, barracks or the mess hall and, and that. So pretty neat to see and explore these old things. Now Camp Dodge, which used to be Camp Peabody, is now a camp for volunteers who, uh, who come during the summer to work on, the, on trails and other projects uh, for the National Forest. And there's still a barracks over in Black Mountain in Haverhill, New Hampshire, uh, which is still around. This is privately owned. So there were, there were two camps that were actually private camps. There was one in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, that was um, a timber company, actually. They wanted to build a road into Canada. And so the deal was, OK, we'll provide a 200-man camp in Pittsburgh, but you have to donate a, a I think it was a 40-acre swath that would become a state forest up to the up to the Canadian border and so they they basically did that and Dolly Cop picnic area some of you have been to Dolly Cop campground and the picnic area this is uh, that they built the many dams at the projects that they accomplished um, over 20 fire lookout towers and here's right after they had built it in 1936 and that thing is still holding up holding up quite well uh, David Draves did a book about builders of men, life in the CCC camps in New Hampshire, mostly the White Mountain camps. There's, a, there's another one for the state of Maine I have, and there's one for Vermont. There's one for, for other states. This is a nice little ending poster here, Great Oaks from Little Acorns, and you see the three CCC acorns in his hand. America's number one resource, her youth, and this is really quite true. Uh, we really need to think about our, our youth. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Say, when did the, did the camps finally close up? Uh, they never officially closed. Uh, I mean, the president could reauthorize them. Uh, but in 1942, um, essentially all the camps had shut down. With uh, the entry in, in December 7, 1941 into World War II, we went into full mobilization. And so there were a lot of jobs. And the camps that had remained were pretty much building barracks for, for troops at various locations around the country. So that was that. And most, and they would have recruiters that would be coming into these uh, camps by then. And they would, you know, and, and, and that was fine. You know, that's the whole purpose of these camps. Train them and get them out. Uh, out to work, yeah. Yes. Did it stay a dollar a day all the way through the night? The whole, the, yeah, the whole, the whole time, dollar a day, yeah. And hopefully some of them, you know, would move on up to thirty-six dollars, thirty-eight dollars, and that. And and if you were caught, if you were caught, your parents sent you some additional money, you were thrown out of camp. Yeah, they were the, the very strict discipline, and it was you had to only get five dollars or you know seven or eight dollars if you were a leader but you could not because this money was supposed to go to the families and, and deal with that well, where was the money coming from um the money came from the treasury and probably i had just probably printing it and the, to imagine people being able to pay taxes <laughs> uh yeah yeah it, it was it was a you know pretty tough thing and the and it wasn't just, you know, because these are essentially untrained men, but there were also contractors that were out there that were running out of work. And so there were programs for them, the CWA called Civil Works Administration. If you've ever driven the Blue Ridge or the Skyline Drive, there were programs there um, that Roosevelt had set up to hire contractors because they were skilled. They had heavy equipment. They knew how to do it, but they didn't have any money. And so they were put to work, and the CCC was sent in afterwards to do the landscaping and to, you know, much of the manual labor. Uh, so, so there were a lot of programs. And it was, a, again, trying to put everyone back to work because it was a pretty grim situation. And we were, we were heading towards revolution. And if you read about the history of farms in the Midwest where a lot of these foreclosures were occurring, there was violence that was occurring. You know, there were people that were, you know, the, doing the auctions that were being run out of town and had death threats and, and that and had to be rescued by the you know, sheriff and, and that. So our situation was grim at that period. More questions? No questions. I guess I would just add uh, information about, because in the state of Maine, some years, well, 
2001, when I was a legislator, I sponsored legislation that erected a large six foot bronze statue next to the State Archive and Museum building in Augusta. Uh, so if you're in Augusta, take a okay. look at that. And the projects that they did here in Maine, I did a whole box of material on it. The, um, this still exists today. I mean, Camden Hill State Park is one state park. Sure. Acadia yeah. National Park, they developed yeah. that. Yeah, two camps um, there. Yeah. If you go to the State House and you look across the street to the Capitol Park, all the large trees in that park were planted by the CCP. Yeah. You go up to Toga, the Veterans Administration, yeah. all the big pines still up there. Yeah. That was the CCC. Yeah. Um, there's so many great examples. Yeah. The, the Baxter State Park, the Toga Road yeah. that goes through Baxter, that was CCC. Yeah, that one book on the CCC in Maine is just details. Oh, that's the one. What's it called? In the Public Interest. In the Public Interest. I was trying to think of it. Yeah, that's a great book and uh, has a lot of information. The Maine Public Library online, you can get a lot of these resources and just take a look at it. Gordon? Yeah, Triple I rolls out of Waterville Valley. Was that built by the CCC? Yeah, the Triple I camp and the Thornton camp worked on that together. Yeah. That was, much of that was an old logging railroad, too, um, on that one part. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'll stick around if you do have any other questions, but I appreciate you coming to learn about the, this really great Civilian Conservation Corps program that uh, a lot of great leaders came out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I've got brochures.